All right, so, so now what, uh, in this last lecture, I want to switch gears and uh, we're going to completely forget about physics and we're going to define some natural geometric objects. And um, uh, I'm, I'm only going to be able to uh, sketch it in the, in the hour uh, that I have. But the point is that, that in the appropriate sense, the volume of these geometric objects will end up corresponding to the scattering amplitude. But I want to do enough so that you can see how the formula we saw a second ago is the, actually the volume of an object that is sort of God-given and uh, naturally defined, even if you'd never heard about amplitudes. So um, let me just give you a sketch of what the idea of the amplitohedron is. And everything is going to be a double generalization of the idea of a triangle. So we're really going to start thinking about all the points on the inside of a triangle. And there's one generalization of a triangle, well, to tetrahedra and simplices in general. So it's triangle to simplex. And this has a generalization into the Grassmannian. I'll tell you what that is. But the generalization of the inside of a triangle into the Grassmannian is something known as the positive Grassmannian. So that's one set of generalizations. And this is something, again, uh, uh, as I was saying at the end of the last lecture, uh, you would have thought, I mean, the Grassmannian is just a space of k planes in n dimensions. Oh, well, the projective space is just a set of lines in n dimensions. The Grassmannian is just a set of k planes in n dimensions. Mr. Grassman, who was a high school teacher uh, in the 1850s, he couldn't get an, an academic job. Uh, so he was, a, he was a high school math teacher. Uh, but he invented, uh, quite, quite strangely for our purposes, both the Grassmann variables that we talk about for supersymmetry, as well as the Grassmannian, which is a set of k-planes in n dimensions. The same Mr. Grassman did, did both things. Um, uh, but anyway, um, uh, that's just a set of k-planes in n dimensions. Again, if you're a physicist, you think, who gives a crap about any of these things? K-planes, boring. You know, what, what could possibly be interesting uh, about these things? Um, but they're boring, but it sounds like a boring sort of thing that mathematicians do. So surely people thought hundreds of years ago about the analog of a triangle inside the uh, Grassmannian, but uh, this was not done. It wasn't done until the 2000s is to figure out what is the analog of the inside of the triangle in the Grassmannian. Around 10 years ago, sort of amazingly, roughly simultaneously with when we were running into these objects from the study of scattering amplitudes, is one of our mathematician friends. Well, I mean, I'm just joking. I, I love mathematicians there. <laughs> it's just a funny, it's just the usual, uh, it's the way that we express affection by making fun of each other. So, um, but anyway, so, so this, this was uh, uh, not studied till t 10 years ago. It's already sort of interesting. It took uh, so long to, to study. But, um, and just like triangles are crucial for building up areas, right? This is the basic building block that like builds up uh, uh, areas. Um, uh, we found that the pieces of the positive Grassmannian uh, were in one-to-one -one correspondence with the, the building blocks out of which you could build up scattering amplitudes, okay? Um, but it was the building blocks and not the whole amplitude itself. And so we were struggling for a long time to find what is the object that actually builds the amplitudes rather than just gives you the building blocks. And well, that's the second natural generalization. We go from a triangle to a polygon, the inside of a convex polygon. And if we generalize the convex polygon into the Grassmannian in exactly the same way that we generalize a triangle, what we get is the first example of an, ampl of an amplitohedron that we call the tree amplitohedron. And this is the object whose volume calculates tree amplitudes. And there's one more generalization, which is that in this geometric setup, you can now ask a natural question of how you can hide particles. So you have, a, you have this big geometry, but you have certain particles you don't want to look at anymore. In a quite literal sense, it's a theory of hidden variables. Okay? Um, but it's not living in any local space time. It's living in this uh, funny Grassmannian space. But in this Grassmannian, you learn how to hide particles. And hiding particles corresponds to calculating quantum corrections. That takes you to the loop amplitohedron and the final up and the final thing to any loop order. Okay? So it's this double generalization. 
And <clears throat> so all I'll have time for in this lecture is uh, to just tell you a little bit about what this generalization is, the first thing, and a little bit about uh, how we define the tree amplitudehedron. But I want to tell you enough so that we can see in one concrete example how it is that out of this, all of this geometry, you get an answer that looks like physics, okay? And where the locality and the unitarity come from um, out of the positive geometry. All right, so let's start again. We already talked in the previous, at the end of the previous lecture, that the points on the inside of a triangle, one, two, three, all the points on the inside, all the points y on the inside of this triangle projectively, are of the form C1, Z1, plus C2, Z2, plus C3, Z3, okay? Uh, so it's C1, C2, C3. Now, uh, I can, it's this up to any rescaling of C1, C2, and C3. So I'll write that as C1, C2, C3, mod GL1, okay? But I have to have that all these Cs are positive. And I'll just say it once and for all here, when I say all positive from now on, I could mean either all positive or all negative. I mean they're all the same sign, okay? It's only the ratios that are GL1 invariant, but just so I don't say it annoyingly this all the time, I'm just gonna from now on say they're all positive. Okay, so that's the inside of a triangle. C1, C2, C3, uh, that triplet of numbers mod GL1 where they're all positive. What's the inside of a simplex? A simplex, is just C1, C2, up to Cn mod GL1 with all the Cas positive, okay? It's tetrahedron and higher simplices. But now we want to find a generalization of this notion. And you see here we're thinking about them, this, this as individual numbers mod GL1, but we can equivalently think of this as a ray, right? It's a ray that passes through an origin, a line that passes through an origin. So these Cs live in Pn minus 1, right? In this picture, the Cs live in Pn minus 1, and they are, so there's, there are one planes in n dimensions. Okay, so what we'd like to do is find some generalization of the notion of the simplex for k planes in n dimensions, okay? So how do I talk about k planes in n dimensions? So this space of k-planes in n dimensions is called the Grassmannian GKN. And well, how do I talk about it? I, I just have to give you k n-dimensional vectors. Uh, so here's a vector v1 up to a vector vk. So these are n-dimensional vectors, and I have to give you k of them. So if I give you k n-dimensional vectors, then the span of those vectors is going to give me the, the k-plane, right? So the data is given by giving you a k by n matrix. But not quite, because uh, if, if I only care about the plane, I should be able to do, so this matrix will be written as C alpha A. Okay, A runs from one to N, and alpha runs from one to K. Okay, but C alpha A should be identified with any K by K linear transformation, okay, on the rows, because all I care about is the plane that's made out of them, right? So it's the space of, so, so this is the space of k by n matrices, C alpha A, k by n matrices, mod GLK. And so we see the dimensionality of the space, for example, dimensionality of GKN is k times n minus the, the k squared from GLK, so that's k times n minus k. Okay, okay so that's, that's the... That's just the, the Grassmannian. That's the space of k planes in n dimensions. But what we want to do is find the analog of the inside of a simplex in the Grassmannian. So the, the analog of simplex is I want to take this k by n matrix, and now let me imagine writing this matrix as a bunch of column vectors, c1 through cn, <coughs> k by n. And I want to somehow say that these are positive. There's something positive about them, right? The positivity is needed to talk about a notion of inside, right? You have to distinguish inside from, from outside. So what should be positive? Well, I can't say that the entries of this matrix are positive because that's not invariant under k by k linear transformations, okay? What is invariant under k by k linear transformations are the determinants of this matrix. 
So all I can say is that the determinants, the k by k subdeterminants, or the minors, so if I take any k columns, ca1 through cak, and I contract them with an epsilon symbol, this is called a minor, this is the minor, a1, ak is, is, a, is a minor of the matrix. Then I can say, well, all the minors are positive. So why, why don't I say that all these minors are positive? Well, we just have to be slightly careful because the minor is anti-symmetric, right? The determinants are anti-symmetric. So I can't literally say that all of them are positive because 1, 2, and 2, 1 can't be both positive. So what I have to do to make sense of this is introduce an ordering. Okay? I have to order the columns 1 through n. Okay? I order them 1 through n. That's not something I have to do for the simplex. I didn't have to order them. But here I have to order them 1 through n and say that they're positive so long as a1, they're ordered. Okay? So 1, 3, 5 is positive, for example. All the ordered ones are positive. OK. Now, that's. Of course, if we think back to amplitudes, it's already interesting because we had the ordering and the scattering amplitudes. And here we see that we need an ordering to make sense of the notion of inside in a simple way in the Grassmannian. All right, let's, let's, let's keep going. Now, when you have a simplex, it's, of course, extremely simple to imagine what the boundaries of the simplex look like. You say that all these Cs are positive, and so you just put one of them to zero at a time. And you go to the boundaries of the simplex. And the boundaries are other simplices. The boundaries of a tetrahedron are triangles. The boundary of a triangle is an interval, right? And to go to the boundaries, these variables that used to be positive, you allow some of them to be 0. Okay? So they're non-negative. So we're doing the same thing here. We want the non-negative uh, Grassmannian, which I'll call the positive Grassmannian. But, uh, uh, but well, you might think, well, we do the same thing. We can send any old minor that we want to 0. And so the boundary structure is kind of trivial. In the case of the simplex, it's trivial. There are other simplices. But it turns out for the Grassmannian, the boundary structure is vastly more rich and structured. And there's a whole, that this is what the sort of 10 years of mathematical literature was about figuring out what the boundaries of the positive Grassmannian really look like. And the reason is that these minors are now nonlinear, and they satisfy quadratic relations between each other. Okay, so, so you can't just set them to zero willy-nilly, one at a time. Instead of saying it abstractly, let me show you what the positive Grassmannian looks like in a particular case, which will be useful in us for a moment. Um, in principle, I should the first simple example is for k equals 2, but I'm actually going to jump to k equals 3, because okay, it's even slightly easier to visualize what's going on. So what does... Uh, I want to show you what does the positive, so there's a positive Grassmannian, we can call G plus Kn, and I want to say what it looks like for K equals 3. So just for fun, imagine that we have this 3 by N matrix, but imagine that the top row of the matrix is positive, all the numbers are positive, there's some subregion which looks like that, and let me rescale all of them to 1, okay? If I rescale them to 1, I don't change the fact that the minors are, are, are positive. Right? So, so just, just so we can visualize it, I'm going to imagine a 3 by n matrix that looks like 1 in the top row. And then down here, there's some little two-dimensional vector x1 up to xn. So this is a 3 by n matrix. And being positive means that 1 xa, 1 xb, 1 xc, that this determinant is positive. for a less than b less than c. So let's get a feeling for what this means. So imagine the x's are just randomly sprinkled on the plane. These are now just literally two-dimensional vectors. Okay. Well, obviously, if I sprinkle them randomly, it's not going to be true that all these determinants will be positive. What does it take for all the determinants to be positive? What do you think it takes? What, what, what do you think these points have to look like for the determinants to be positive? They have to be organized into the vertices of a convex polygon. x1, x2, x3, and so on, up to xn. OK? 
And why is that? Because what is this determinant? This determinant is just the signed area of the triangle uh, with vertices A, B, and C. So this is just telling you that every triangle A, B, C has got to be oriented the same way. <laughs> and for that to be true, well, that's, it's, it's obviously true that they have to be inside the convex polygon. So you see 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 4, 1, 3, 5. Everything is oriented uh, in, the, in the correct way. OK? But now from this picture, we can see why the boundary structure is so much richer. Let's say I take, so this is a generic point in positive G3n. But let's say I want to take one of these minors. I want to take the minor, let's say, 1, 3, 5. I want to take the minor 1, 3, 5 and put it to 0. Okay. Now, what does it mean for the minor 1, 3, 5 to be 0? It means that this triangle's area is collapsing to 0, which means just that the points A, B, and C lie in a straight line. right? So let's say I do it. I take this point x3, and I want to drag it to, to live on the line 1, 5. Okay, so here I go. I'm going to take x3. I'm moving it, moving it. Oops. Before I get to hit the line 1, 5, it will actually lie on the line 2, 4. And now if I keep going, it won't be a convex polygon anymore. <laughs> okay? So the moduli space of points, the, the moduli space of convex polygons <laughs> uh, is the positive G3n in this case. And it's very rich for this reason, because as we start collapsing the sides, first you can make consecutive points uh, lie on straight lines. Then you can do more interesting things, like once 2, 3, and 4 on a line, I can put 4, 5, and 6 on a line. That's one thing I can do. Or I can take 2, 3, and 4, and I can take 3 and move it to the point 4, or move it to the point 1, and so on. Okay, So, so there's a large set of uh, moves that I'm allowed to do combinatorially, and you have to keep track of uh, the thing that you're allowed to do next depends on where you came from. And anyway, there's a very, very rich structure for what this very simple object of the moduli space of convex polygons actually looks like. So I'm not going to describe anything uh, about it. It turns out to be uh, all the facets of the positive Rasmanian are in one-to-one -one correspondence with certain kinds of permutations. So there's ultimately uh, there's a combinatorial object that sits underneath all of this. Um, but all I want you to see from here just is that is where the sort of richness and uh, complexity in the boundary structure comes from. All right. So that's the positive Grassmannian. A very simple object to define, just the k by n matrices with all minors positive. Okay? And that's the analog of the inside of a triangle in the Grassmannian. OK. But now let's keep going to the second generalization of a triangle to a polygon. Or the inside of a convex polygon. <coughs> OK, so so let's say I want to talk about the points on the inside of this polygon. Well, uh, all the points on the inside have exactly the same feature. They're all just a positive combination. Uh, I imagine that their masses on the outside is the same weighted average center of mass idea. All the points are of this form. Okay, the yi are z1 up to zn. Again, this is all projective, so i is running from 1 to 3 here. Okay, it's a two-dimensional picture, but it's, uh, the vectors are, are three-dimensional. It's, it's a projective picture. Um, and all the C's are, all the C's are defined up to GL1, and the C's are all positive. Okay? But, but, I need to make sure that the Z's are not random. If the Z's are totally random, then I'm not going to get this picture. I want a convex polygon, not a, not a random, uh, uh, I want a convex polygon. So that means that I also have to demand, we just learned what convexity means. Uh, I have to demand that the minors made out of the Zs, ZA1, ZA2, ZA3, are all positive if they're ordered. OK? So already you see that the notion of the inside of a polygon 
is very slightly sophisticated, right? The inside of a polygon is jamming together two different positive structures. On the one hand, we say that the external data is positive, okay? And then we take a positive combination of the positive external data, okay? So the data is fixed, and I scan over all the weight Cs, um, which are positive, and that carves out a region in the projective space P2, which is the inside of the polygon. Now I can have a notion of, uh, I can triangulate this polygon. That's a, if, we, if we want to sort of cover it, I can triangulate the polygon. Now what does a triangulation mean? You see, uh, the space of C's is n-dimensional, or n minus one dimensional, when we mod up by the GL1. It's much larger than the two-dimensional space of the polygon, right? So it's, that's a highly redundant map. It's a highly, highly redundant map from the space of C's into the Y space. So a triangulation corresponds to finding a two-dimensional cells, two-dimensional subregions in positive G1n. So you see, these guys live in positive G1n. The data is in positive G3n. But what I want, a triangulation corresponds to, for example, the inside of this triangle with, with corners are 1, 3, and 4 corresponds to a C, which is, which is some C1, and C2 is 0, and C3 is C3, and C4 is C4, and the rest of them are 0, okay? So if I set everything to 0 but three of the Cs and they're positive, then I cover the inside of this little triangle. So a triangulation corresponds to picking certain two-dimensional cells of positive G1n, Right? Any two-dimensional cell positive G1n has an image with a triangle. And a triangulation is choosing a particularly nice combination of these cells that covers the space. So a triangulation, for example, is the sum of 1 i, i plus 1. These triangles, like 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 4, 1, 4, 5. And so these are a bunch of triangles that cover the inside of the space. OK? Now in this case, this is all, it's all very visual and we can see it, we can see it all in action just by drawing pictures. In a moment, we're going to have to learn how to do this without being able to draw pictures because we're going to go outside things that we can visualize in two or three dimensions. So let's just talk about how we could discover some of these things sort of purely algebraically. Okay? How could we discover purely algebraically? Uh, for example, an important feature of the polygon is that the boundaries of the polygon, the boundaries of the polygon correspond, so y is some point inside the polygon. The boundary corresponds to when y lies on one of these lines, right? So I want to know what corresponds to the boundaries. Well, it's when y lies on a line like 1, 2, or 2, 3. In general, it's when y, zi, zi plus 1 goes to 0. These are, these are the boundaries, okay? Now again, it's obvious from the picture of the polygon that it's one, two, two, three, three, four, and so on. But how could we discover that if we were blind, we couldn't draw a picture and see it, okay? Well, let's say we want to investigate whether a given Z A Z B, is Z A Z B, is Z A Z B a boundary of the space? ZAZB being, being a boundary means that YZAZB would have to be always have one sign. Let's say always be positive or greater than or equal to a zero somewhere. Okay? And so the boundary would correspond to it hitting zero. So just by contrast, if I look at this example of a square, one, two, three, four, you see that Y12 is always positive, but Y13, if y is in here, then y13 is positive. But if y is here, y13 is negative. And that's because as I move in the interior of the space, in the middle somewhere, y13 goes to 0. But it's in the middle of the space. It's not on the boundary, so it can have either sign. Okay? So what it means for it to be a boundary is that you find some, some line segment where y, z, a, z, b is always positive. 
Again, here it's all trivial because we see the answer, but let's see how we discover algebraically that this is where the boundary is. Um, well, first, why is there any hope that there are boundaries at all? Well, let's, let's, let's expand it. So we said that y looks like C1Z1 plus CNZN, so that y Z A Z B would look like C1 1 A B plus C2 2 A B plus dot dot plus C N N A B. And now you see there is a hope that this might be positive because the C's are all positive and also these brackets are all positive if the Z's are ordered, if the Z's are ordered, right? If they're correctly ordered. So there is a hope that sometimes they might be positive. But now, let's see when they are positive. And let me draw a picture. This circle is now just a circle of indices. One, two, three, four. Somewhere here there's A. Somewhere here there's B. Okay, and then we're back to N. Okay, so the C's are all positive. That's good. What about these brackets? Well, so one A, B is positive. Okay, that's fine. If, if A is less than B, that's fine. Well, maybe two A, B is positive. But you see, eventually, someone in here is going to be negative. There are some indices that might be there between A and B. If there's any space between A and B, there's always some bracket in there that's going to be negative because it'll be out of order, right? If there's some K here, there'll be something that looks like KAB, which is negative AKB, and so this is negative. And if it's true that there's any one guy in there that's negative, we're screwed because there's always the C that just makes that one more important than the rest of them, and we can make Y, Z, A, Z, B arbitrarily negative. So we can see that the only way we can have a situation where this always has the same sign is if there's no space at all between A and B. Okay? And that's how we discover that the boundaries are of the form I, I plus one which of course, again, we see from the uh, picture. So we discover that y, zi, zi plus one is positive, all right? And now, now let's say we want to triangulate the space. Well, what does a triangulation mean? It means we want to cover it with a bunch of triangles such that the boundaries of the triangle are just the union of all these i plus ones. Well, so then what are you going to do? You know that you have to have these i plus ones. So the simplest thing to do is to have some triangle that has I, I plus one in it, and just has any other point. Just put any other point that you want in there. And algebraically, how do we see that this is the boundary? Well, I just take the boundary of this region, and this is just in the usual sense of boundary, this is the sum over I star I minus star I plus one plus I, I plus one. That's the usual anti-symmetry of the boundary operator. And this sum cancels telescopically over I. So that's how I see that the boundary is indeed the sum of i i plus 1. So that's why that's such a simple and canonical triangulation. And the example where I put it at 1 is just you know one where, where the triangulation point I chose to be uh, one of the points of the polygon to be as efficient as possible. OK. All right. Now let's generalize uh, away from a polygon. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stay in projective space even. I'm not going to go to a higher space. I'll stay. Well, actually, let, let's, let's jump first straight to the full definition. OK, so now I want to generalize this notion of the inside of a polygon to the Grassmannian. And so what I'm going to do is the following. So instead of having. Uh, uh, so what we had here, polygon, was something that lived. It was a one plane in one plus two dimensions. This is the space of y, okay? Y i, which is just this is uh, this is p two, which is the same as g one three, and uh, and and we defined a region inside G13, which was the inside of the polygon. Okay. And how do we define this region? It was that Yi was Ca 
Z-A-I, summed over A, right? So I runs from one to three, A runs from one to N. So a little bit more loosely, we are just saying that Y is equal to C dot Z, where C is positive and Z is positive. Okay, so that's a little mnemonic for what, what, what we did. The external data was positive and the Cs were positive. So now we're gonna generalize this. We're going to have Ys that live as K planes in K plus M dimensions. Okay, M is just gonna be any integer, one, two, higher. Uh, here was the case M equals two and K equals one. Um, and so we're gonna have external data The external data is going to be just uh, n points, z a i, in k plus m dimensions. Okay, so i is going to run from one to k plus m. And now I have to tell you how to carve out a region in the space of k planes in k plus m dimensions. So, so the y's there's going to be k, k plus m dimensional vectors. So alpha is going to run from one to k. And I want this to be a linear combination of the positive external data. Okay. So once again, that runs from one to k plus m. So this is fixed, this data is fixed, but it has to be positive. Positive in the sense that ZA1, these minors, ZA k plus m, are positive. This is fixed data, external data. And the C's have got to be positive in the sense of being in the positive Grassmannian GKN. So that, so that all these ordered minors of the C's, CA1 through CAK, are positive. Okay, so that's it. This, this, this defines the analog of the inside of the poly, of a polygon in the Grassmannian. And that's the amplitohedron. That's the tree amplitohedron. So this is the tree amplitohedron for a uh, uh, tree amplitohedron that's labeled by N, K, and, this, uh, and M, and it lives in the space of Y with the Z's as external data. So that's what the object is, just uh, geometrically. Now, for physics, it turns out that actually all the m's are important. But, uh, but, uh, but most obviously, to begin with, for physics, we have m equals 4. Okay. So I'm telling you that the external data is k plus 4 dimensional k plus four-dimensional vectors. Now the four you saw a second ago, that, that was these bosonic uh, momentum twisters we were talking about, are just that four-dimensional uh, four dimensional vectors for each external particle. There are these extra k directions here, though, right? What are these extra k directions? We didn't have that before. That's the part that I don't have time to explain. Uh, but in this story, there's no supersymmetry, obviously. There's no etas, there's no super variables. Everything is bosonic. The geometry is completely bosonic. All of the super stuff is encoded in those extra components of the Zs, okay? Bosonically encoded in the extra components of the Zs. And actually, geometrically, what's going on is you have this K plane. So if you imagine you have this, this is a schematic picture. You have a K plus four dimensional space. Here's Y. There's a, there's Y is a, K plane in this K plus four dimensional space. Uh, and now the Zs are points, but some pieces of these vectors are in the direction of the Y and some are not. And the ones that are not in the direction of the Y, these are the momentum twisters that we talked about before. And the parts that are in the direction of the Ys is where all the super stuff goes here. But is encoded in a completely bosonic way. So in the end, it's really true that if you handed me the kinematical external data, I associate with it canonically uh, this configuration of points 
in the in k plus four dimensions. Okay. <clears throat> Now, something else that I haven't told you, so this is just a space. How am I getting functions out of this? Scattering amplitudes are functions. They're not, uh, they're not just, just spaces. Um, but once you have the space, if I go back to the polygon, if I go back to the polygon, what I have is What I have is here's y, and here's this region. There's this natural region associated with it. Now, it turns out, and this is a, a non-trivial fact, but it turns out that for these kinds of spaces, um, once you specify a region, there is a certain, so here, here I, have, I have a polygon. Uh, there's a certain differential form in, in y space. There's a certain differential form on y that depends on p. And this differential form has the property with the property that it has, it's fixed by the geometry by the property of having poles, or more generally, logarithmic singularities, when you start taking higher residues other than just the co-dimension one singularities, uh, logarithmic singularities. on all the boundaries of P, of the shape. What this means is that in the neighborhood of any place where the form develops singularities, there is a choice of coordinates where in that neighborhood, in the neighborhood of any locus of singularities, the form looks like dx1 over x1 up to dxd over xd, if it's a d form. Okay? That's what it means of having logarithmic singularities. Okay? What's important about this kind of singularity is that if you take residues, if you just take one complex variable, dx over x, means that you surround it with a circle, and when you take a residue, you get one. Okay? And this means that this generalizes, so the singularities as a complex object, this thing has singularities where you take tori and surround all the possible, uh, all the possible uh, lower dimensional boundaries of the object that you're talking about, and all the residues are one. It's the simplest possible singularities you can have. But that's how associated with the geometry, you uh, given a geometry, there's a certain differential form with logarithmic singularities on the boundary of that geometry. And that's how, given the geometry, we get a function. Okay? And that function is the scattering amplitude. Why do we know it's a scattering amplitude? Because uh, the properties of the geometry force this form to have exactly the singularities that the scattering amplitude has to have, which involves putting particles on shell and all the rest of those things that we give all these physics interpretation to in terms of evolution, unitary evolution in spacetime, uh, is interpreted here instead as a, as a consequence of what the, of what the boundaries of this uh, positive geometry looks like. Okay, yes? That, that's, that, no, no, it's, a, a, well, a, a particle going on shell in this picture corresponds to moving y to the boundaries, okay? So, so, so exploring the singularities of the function means, you see, uh, uh, this, this I don't have time to, to explain in more detail, but in the usual picture, you would take the data and you move the data until you encounter a singularity. That's dualized here with the data staying fixed and you move y around until you hit the, uh, until you hit the singularities. And so the singularities of the amplitude corresponds to just hitting boundaries of the amplitude. Uh, but the fact, that the, the fact that the amplitude factorizes when you sit on a pole is, the ge is reflecting the geometric fact that if you take this c dot z space, and all the magic is with those determinants, those determinants being positive. Uh, um, uh, it has the feature that when you go to a boundary, you discover that the amplitohedron breaks up. And on the boundary, what the geometry looks like is the two lower amplitohedra uh, glued together with the addition of one additional piece of uh, apparent external data corresponding to the internal line. Okay? But that's a, that's a feature of the, that's a feature of the uh, geometry. Yeah. Yeah.
That's right. The, 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 in this language, the actual residue would, would correspond, as usual, when we have an amplitude, the residue would, the residue of the amplitude would correspond to the amplitude that you made it multiplied by the amplitude that it decayed on the other side. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so just in the, uh, so anyway, that's, the, so that's just the definition of, of the tree amplitude. I don't have time to define the idea of hiding particles in the loop amplitude. All I want to do in the, in the last uh, few minutes is go back to the simplest case of k equals 1, m equals 4, where it's, we, we're not even seeing the fancy Grassmannian structure yet here. This is still just going to be living in a projective space, so it's just, just a polytope, um, uh, but where we can, uh, where we can uh, see how we make contact with the physics that I told you about. So, so we're doing k equals 1, m equals 4. So the y's are just the sum of, are just C A, Z A I, but these Z's now are five dimensional, and they satisfy Z A one through Z A five are positive when the A's are ordered, and the C's are positive. Okay, that's the space that we're talking about. So now this is living in G one five or P four. So it's a four-dimensional shape, not a two-dimensional shape, okay? So it's harder to visualize, but let's try to figure out where are the boundaries. Where are the boundaries? So let's just mimic the exercise we did for the polygon. We want to ask, so the boundary is now going to involve four z's rather than two z's, but where is, can I have z a, z b, z c, z d? Can I have y, z a, b, z, this all be positive? Is that possible? Well, it's exactly what we did before. It would be c1, 1 a, b, c, d, plus dot dot plus c n, n a, b, c, d should be positive. And let's again draw the circle of indices, one, two, now I have an A, a B, a C, and a D, and then down to N, okay? And just like in the case of the polygon, we find that it could be, has a chance to all be positive because these minors ordered are positive and the Cs are positive, but if there's any space between A and B, if there's any room there, then I'll get something negative. If there's any room in any of these places, then I'll get something negative. Okay? There is only one way that it's always positive, and that's when it looks like i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. Okay? The only when it's the boundaries are when y, z, i, z, i plus 1, z, j, z, j plus 1 goes to 0, and then you can say that all, everything is positive. Okay? Because there's no room between, you only ever have to jump over an even number of guys in order to reorder it, and so it's always positive. So that's, that's quite striking, because it's, remember, we're asking on general grounds, we have a function of a bunch of zi's, why would it care about i, I plus 1 and jj plus 1? That's, that's locality, right? That's that the, the, the poles should know about when xi minus xj squared goes to 0. Right? Why, even though it's a function of the z's, does it care about the lines i, I plus 1, j, j plus 1? Well, that's a consequence of just the, the, uh, of the, of the positive geometry in this case. Okay? So we discover that the boundaries, so we discover that, that, that the boundaries are just the sum over, over all i, j of this i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1s. And so how do we triangulate this space? It's exactly the same. So the, the, the space is triangulated by the sum over i and j of some star i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. And by exactly the same argument as for the polygon, you can discover that the, that the boundaries of this, everything that doesn't involve i, i plus 1, cancels telescopically, and you're just left with, uh, with the boundaries that, that we want. So, so, uh, so, so that's, that's the geometry in this case. It's triangulated by exactly the objects that we were talking about for the amplitude. And the final part 
uh, is if you just work out what is the form of logarithmic singularities, <laughs> which tr just turns out to essentially be the area of these, the volume of these uh, simplices, it's the area of the triangles in the previous <laughs> example um, that, that you precisely get to the, to the formula for the scattering amplitude. So, so that just, that's a little taste of what it looks like um, uh, in the more general cases. In the more general cases, it's much more intricate because the geometry is not linear. So the boundaries are not defined by linear equations. There's a much richer, uh, uh, there, there's, there's a much uh, uh, richer structure involved. But uh, here at least you, you see the sort of first taste of how it is that, that the positivity is enforcing these physical properties. Uh, in this case, uh, most clearly locality, but when you go to the more, the, the, the richer examples, you see both the locality and the unitarity at tree and loop level coming out of this, uh, coming out of this uh, picture. All right, I'll leave it at that, thanks. <laughs>